those of you who don't know me, and there are probably many of you, I'm new to PCMI, so I teach in Montrose, Colorado. I teach Algebra 1, and I teach AP Calculus and AP Stats. So I kind of have kids on the ends of the spectrum. And what I'm going to show you is a compilation of things that I have stolen, which every good teacher does, right? There's almost nothing original in teaching anymore. Uh, I may take credit for one of two things, but I'm sure somebody else has done it before. So, nothing new to see. All right, next slide. This activity is something that I try to do at the beginning of the year. And what I'm trying to do is, number one, build community in my classroom. So what I do, um, this came from a course called Reading Apprenticeship that I took. If you ever get the chance, I really recommend it. And I use it in about the first two weeks. I tell my students my backstory, um, the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever. And I make sure I tell them times that I've struggled with math in the past, because of course when we walk in as teachers, they think that we sprung from the womb knowing all the things that we know. And so I try to dash that right away. And then the five questions on the side are what I ask them to write about. The whole activity only takes about 15 minutes. And so you'd be surprised when you share your weaknesses with students, they share lots and lots of things with you. And so I ask them, in fact, I usually have them close their eyes and I say, I want you to think back to elementary school. We sort of go on a little uh, journey there. And then they write about it. Um, they tell me lots and lots of really revealing things about themselves. And then what do I do with that? Well, I certainly identify students who need some extra TLC because they'll tell me things like traumatic experiences they've had in math classrooms, and I definitely want to be aware of those. Um, I also use it, because I, I tend to do it, you know that time in the class where you're kind of know kids' names, but like in my class, I have a lot of blonde girls, and like, okay, blonde girl number one, blonde girl number two, can't quite tell them apart yet. So I read those early on, and then again, I come back and read them several weeks later. And it's very interesting, because then I say, oh, right, Carrie wrote that one thing when I thought she was blonde girl number one. Yeah, now I know it means more. The other thing that I really like about this is some students write you really in-depth things. Some students write you very little. But that tells me something in and of itself. Either with that student who writes very, very little, I haven't earned their trust yet, or they have difficulty reflecting and articulating on it, you know, really giving me insight into their thinking and they might need some help um, Next slide. I also use sort of a standards mastery hybrid of my own creation. And so not all my students, or not all my teachers in my building use the same thing. So when I get students, um, many of them have to make some paradigm shifts. And so I'm gonna show you some tools that I use with them to get them thinking about how they see the grading process. Next slide. <clears throat> this is something I do early on, and I try to reinforce that what they're gonna experience with me is probably not what they've experienced before. So I just ask them to draw a line, a curve, a squiggle, a crash and burn, a triumph, I don't know, whatever, that would describe sort of what their progress looks like. They are really honest in this exercise, which is great. And again, I, I tell them, what's status quo for you? Some of them will also say, here's what it looked like last year, but that's not normal for me. And then they'll articulate, so I get this great background on the Next slide. I give them this series of agree, disagree statements. Um, this should also end up being available to you so you don't have to um, try to write them all down. But notice, I've got some stuff in here about growth mindset to try to see if there are students who, for example, tell me um, to get a good grade in math, you need to be a math person. If they strongly agree with that statement, that's something I'd want to know ahead of time. And that way I can just get a sense of my students and what their perceptions are before we begin discussions on grading and where maybe their current perception and my paradigm are going to be really out of alignment so that I can prepare activities and discussion items. And again, what you're seeing here takes just a few minutes to do. It's not very long. Next slide. I'll let you take it. 
take a look at these two questions. I would say no matter how you grade, ask these questions in your class and see what kind of responses you get. Because for many students, this is very revealing, their responses to this sort of thing. And you'll be surprised at the insights that they will offer you with these questions. And again, I do this early in this term, and they become discussion items and so forth later on. Okay, next slide. Um, I am a bit of a assessment wonk, and so believe it or not, I learned a lot about assessment from being on my state assessment committee. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did learn a model for depth of knowledge, which I actually bring into my classroom and teach to my students, which might seem like a weird thing to you. Um, and if you really want to know, I know there are different models. You may have seen other models, but this is your real thumbnail sketch of, of what I use. And so what I do with my students is I say, hey guys, there are levels to these tasks, and not all tasks are the same. And if you can become aware as a learner, and for example in calculus, we talk about level one, level two tasks are your basic tools. Stuff you need to know. Like, I don't know, the derivative or tangent, right? And you kind of know it or you kind of don't. There are some things you can derive, but at the same time, you have to decide, am I going to memorize this, am I not? Um, level two task might be, you know, the chain rule. It's a procedure. And if I say, take the derivative, I'm going to choose a procedure. It's pretty well prescribed, you, you follow it, it's a recipe. Level three, level four is really more what gets both kids that I teach, the freshmen and the seniors, in trouble because they look at the problem, they don't immediately know how to do it, Therefore, they assume they can't do it. I don't know if that happens to you. Maybe that's just my kids. I don't know. But when I tell them this and I say, hey, when you read a question and don't immediately know what to do and there's no prompting or scaffolding in the question, guess what? It's a level three. Therefore, you're going to have to look in your toolbox. What's in there? The level one, level stuff, level two stuff, that's what's in your toolbox. Open your toolbox. What's in there? What could you use? Calculus, I was telling you, you got two tools, hammer and saw. That's it, mm -hmm. right? You got derivatives integral, that's all you got. So you got to really make sure that as you're going through that, um, you're only using those tools and not trying to make up a new tool or put two tools together or anything like that. And I think it gives them a way to think about the process they're using. Next slide. This is something I pilfered from a lady named Jane Pollock. If you ever get a chance to hear her at a conference, I recommend it. She talked about using daily objectives, which I don't know about you, but I have to put on my board every day. And so I write them in the I can format. I don't know if you do or not. But this is a sheet I give to my students. They have to fill in the date. Uh, they can check if they were absent that day. That just reminds them a month later, oh, I missed that day. Right. Then they write the I can. They circle a number, and so one means I know nothing about this objective. A five means I can teach it to somebody else before the lesson, and then as the closure after the lesson. They update the number, and of course, I hope the number improves. We also use these to um, when we're building reviews for tests. And so we go back and say, well, gee, what have been the objectives that we've studied every day? So this is a really, really simple tool to use. Next slide. This one, um, the work of Daniel Willingham, another author I really recommend. He's a cognitive scientist. He writes about um, working memory. And I'll just tell you the analogy I use for the time I have left. Um, I bring in a crate, kind of like this one, to my classroom. And I say, hey guys, this crate can't get bigger or smaller. It doesn't stretch. It represents your working memory. Your working memory um, is a finite size. You can't make it bigger, you can't make it smaller, but you can only fit so much stuff in. And so we talk about things like, hey, if I walk in and I just had a fight with my boyfriend in the hall, I have this big thing and I have things that I put in the crate to go, this is taking up a lot of my working memory right now. The other thing I talk about is when we can't chunk, say for example, I don't know my times tables, then doing a multiplication problem takes up a big part of my working memory. And so we talk about how do you deal with it when your box is full. We talk about emptying, so that's emptying the box. And that's a metaphor that we use in class a lot 
to say, sometimes you have to walk in and find a way to empty your box. I don't know why. Okay. <laughs> and kids will, I will hear them say, screw if I gotta empty my box today. And so we talk about some ways that they can do that so that they can focus on the math. 